Bienvenidos. Welcome to the U.S. Latino Digital Humanities Recovering the Past, Creating the Future panel. My name is Gabriela Baeza Ventura. I am Associate Professor of Spanish in the Department of Hispanic Studies, Executive Editor at Arte Publico Press, and Co-Founder of the U.S. Latino Digital Humanities Program at the University of Houston. My name is Carolina Villarroel. I'm the Frown Foundation Director of Research at the Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program and co-founder of the U.S. Latino Digital Humanities Program at the University of Houston. My name is Linda Garcia Merchant. I am the U.S. Latino Digital Humanities Postdoctoral Fellow for the Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program at Arte Publico Press at the University of Houston. Hi, my name is Lorena Gotro. I am the Digital Programs Manager at the University of Houston's Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program. My colleagues and I are honored to be part of the 2020 DLF Forum. Together, we stand on the shoulders of the Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Founders, scholars, activists, librarians, and community members who along with the founder and director of Arte Publico Press and Recovery, Dr. Nicolás Canelos, have fought against the erasure of the history and legacy of the Latino people in the United States. Their mission was one of social justice, to right the wrongs in a historical record that did not include Latina and Latino voices, and to write, as in the act of writing, documenting, those missing voices into historical, literary, and cultural discourse. Empowered by their activism and the impressive amount of data revealed by their research, we founded the U.S. Latino Digital Humanities U.S. LDH program at the University of Houston to extend their goals and mission beyond printed media and into virtual spaces. If we forget ourselves, who will be there to remember us? Sherry Moraga, native country of the heart. U.S. LDH was founded in part with a generous grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and a clear postdoctoral fellowship we are grateful for their support. Our goals for the USLDH program include serving as a physical space for the development, support, and training in digital humanities projects using the recovery collection of newspapers, photographs, and digital materials. To create opportunities and facilities for digital publication of Latino-based projects and scholarship. And we recently celebrated the launch of APP Digital through the Manifold platform. To promote and foster interdisciplinary scholarly work with our immediate communities in and outside academia across the nation and internationally. To provide a communal virtual space to share knowledge and projects related to Latina and Latino digital humanities. And to establish a Latina Latino digital hub to document the rich digital activity that is taking place in the United States. It is through all these activities that we continue to work in the recovery, dissemination, and preservation of our history. For if we recover our past, we can create our future. In this presentation, my USLDH colleagues and I will speak um, about the following topics. Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program, our guiding principles, Omeka as pedagogy, and community outreach. Thank you. Gracias, and welcome to our talk. Now my colleague, Dr. Carolina Villarroel, will start us off with recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program. Latinos and Latinas have been an integral part of this territory even before it was the United States. Since colonial times, from 16th century explorations and settlements, the U.S. territory has been a destination for colonization by European countries and later for political exiles and immigrants from all Latin America and Spain. All have contributed to the culture of the United States, although a big part of this documentary legacy has been lost or is subject to recovery. As Arte Publico Press and recovery founder and director Nicolás Canelos states, during nearly two centuries of anti-Hispanic propaganda and the creation of stereotypes and negative images in popular culture, it is no wonder that so much has been lost of our cultural history in the United States. As a reflection of this, the official institutions in charge of the preservation of a country's history, the archive, 
for many years did not collect and preserve the Latino community's intellectual and cultural written legacy that includes hundreds of newspapers, thousands of books, published and unpublished manuscripts, memoirs, correspondence, etc. A legacy that could have and should have been part of the official record in our educational curriculum. Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program was founded to fulfill the mission of locating, preserving, and making available this legacy and creating an alternative archive, or what the American Studies scholar Rodrigo Lasso calls a migrant archive, one that describes transnational histories and resides in obscurity. It is always on the edge of annihilation. They are the text of the past that have not been written into the official spaces of archivization, even though they weave in and out of the buildings that house them. The scope of the program is broad and encompasses the recovery of all written legacy from 16th century explorations until 1980. Since its creation in 1991, recovery has grown its community of scholars, students, and community historians to hundreds around the United States and abroad interested in preserving and including the written legacy of Latinas and Latinos, a population that now makes up the largest minority group in the United States. Since its inception, recovery has also become somewhat of a sub-discipline in Spanish, English, American studies, history, and ethnic studies. Understanding the Latino community's distrust of the official institutions that have not deemed their cultural legacy important enough to be preserved, as in the case of many underrepresented communities, recovery has worked since its beginnings under the model that is now called post-custodial. Recovery works with community members and owners of collections to preserve historical materials, makes digital surrogates, and then returns the collections along with digital copies to their owners. In the process, the program also advocates for owners of collections to consider donating the originals to archival repositories, not only for preservation purposes, but also for representation. For recovery, these collections are more than just a collection of materials, but an opportunity for healing and reconciliation with our past and history, and a process to learn to value the overlooked importance of our contributions to this country's cultural legacy. Over the course of the years and under the umbrella of Arte Publico Press, the largest and oldest Latino press in the United States and a nonprofit organization, recovery has preserved thousands of historical materials, mainly in Spanish, but also in English, French, and Ladino, has provided funding for research, 189 grants and counting, created an interdisciplinary board of specialists that represents the diversity of the materials with representation in areas such as history, religion, women's studies, archives, literature, etc. Published the first comprehensive anthology of Latino literature in 2002 with Oxford University Press and a companion in Spanish with Arte Publico Press. Built databases and bibliographies, microfilm and digitized historical documents, held uh, by annual conference that is now in its 10th iteration, printed around 40 volumes of recovered work, underwrote the microfilm of various Latino collections from New York to Los Angeles, and built partnerships with institutions abroad who might have or might be missing parts of their own documentary history and whose legacy is intertwined with the US, such as Cuba, Mexico, Puerto Rico, etc. Thus, this work has been fundamental in establishing the field of U.S. Latino studies. Part of the work through the years has been the creation of a comprehensive bibliography of more than 20,000 records of printed materials that includes from one page broadside to maps, cookbooks, memoirs, poetry, historical accounts, anthropology, grammar teaching volumes, treaties, religious volumes, etc. Today, Recovery has one of the largest collections of Hispanic language periodicals published in the United States before 1960. The collection of more than 1,400 titles includes the first newspaper published in Spanish in the U.S. territory, El Mississippi, published in New Orleans in 1808. 
the first newspaper published in Texas, La Gaceta de Texas, published in Nacogdoches, Texas in 1813, and Feminismo Internacional, or International Feminism, published in New York in 1922 by Mexican exile and feminist Elena Dismenti. The collection also includes bilingual and trilingual newspapers, newspapers in Ladino, and a collection of more than 100 anarchist newspapers. Recovery has also received collections that document not only the daily life of Latinas and Latinas in the United States, but also collections that speak of leadership, intellectual life, and participation, and the history of many firsts through the country's history. Collections are welcomed and incorporated, processed and digitized, and later returned to owners or moved to the archives at the University of Houston, with which we have partnership for years and whose Hispanic collections we have helped to build in large part. Perhaps one of the collections that most represent the recovery process and the transnational nature of many of our collections is the Leonor Villegas de Magnon papers. Leonor Villegas de Magnon, or how she called herself, the rebel, was a Mexican woman living in Laredo, Texas, who by the time of the Mexican Revolution sided with the constitutionalists led by Venustiano Carranza, who later became president of Mexico. The rebel, along with Mexican, Mexican American and Anglo women, founded the White Cross, a group of nurses to tend to the wounded, but also who also serve as spies and political allies. Villegas understood clearly her place in history and hired a photographer to hold, follow her and document her side of the revolution. By the end of the conflict, she realized that women were excluded not only from the political process of the creation of the new nation, but also from the historical account. So she decided to write her memoirs. After trying unsuccessfully to publish it in Mexico, she rewrote it in English and tried for years to have it published in the United States. By the third generation of Leonor's, our colleague and board member Clara Lomas found a lead in a piece of newspaper in Laredo. The whole run of the newspaper was in an archival institution in the Netherlands, and she set a research trip to retrieve it. The newspaper sent her back to Laredo where a family member mentioned that the collection was in the ha hands of Leonor's granddaughter in Houston, Texas. The program was then able to connect with the family and the family was ecstatic to finally be able to fulfill Leonor's wishes. Arte Publico Press published both manuscripts, the Spanish version in conjunction with National Institute of Anthropology and History in Mexico. The collection was digitized and has been the object of many scholarly publications, exhibits, and recently the topic of a bilingual digital exhibit titled Entre Balas y Rugidos, created by our colleague at the Houston Community College, Melinda Mejia. Our collections are available through our program, the University of Houston Archives, through our website and digital humanities projects, and also through curated collections in EBSCO and Newsbank. We invite you to follow and support our community's work. Learn more about the rich legacy and contributions of Latinas and Latinos in the U.S. Next, my colleague, Dr. Linda Garcia Merchant, will talk about our guiding principles of community engagement. Thank you, Dr. Villarroel, for the introduction. I begin this section of the talk with a quote from Chicana feminist scholar, Maria Cotera, that describes the archive as a living, active experience of encuentro between the present and the past, with the potential to enact new strategies of alliance and a new praxis. We believe that the archive is a bi-directional action, a space to develop new ways to experience and interact with scholars, practitioners, community members, and students of all ages, working with the materials and their owners, if still living. And in order to create these guiding principles that direct our and influence our work, these practices were established over the two generations that Arte Publico and the Recovery Program have cultivated the resources and collections presented earlier in this talk by Dr. Villarreal and later where well, you will see examples in the classroom by Dr. Baez Aventura and in the community by Dr. Gautreau. 
The goal was to create a sustainable model of the collection of these materials. In order to do this, the recovery program had to build both the community and the disciplines that the archive represents. In order to build a community within a discipline, we first had to begin with the community, understanding the value of contributions that occur with both the subject, the object, and the experience of both. Building community means building networks of participants that includes both subjects and practitioners in a multidisciplinary approach to the accumulation of knowledge. With institutional scholars from a variety of disciplines discovering hidden or discarded histories, now recovered and addressed in ways that develop Latino and Latina scholarship. One example of this is the Biennial Conference, recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Conference, held at the University of Houston to highlight the work of this community of scholars, practitioners, and students. It is also with community members and cultural practitioners looking to cultivate and sustain local histories through public library collections and institutional collecting relationships, one of which you will see with our relationship with the national organization, local chapter of LULAC. But once you establish these relationships, you have, you have to then begin to build networks. The practice of creating networks applies the development of the infrastructure needs of collections, archivists, writers, media specialists, and technologists to cultivate and support the community archive. Culturally representational persons add a language and focus to the building of a sustainable model of collection. These can include institutional networks within university programs interested in reconstituting the cultural and documentary history of Latinos and Latinas. Librarians and archivists eager to expand their collections to include the written legacy of Latinos and Latinas. Cultural practitioners from both the arts and technology looking to interpret, visualize, and otherwise articulate this material corpora. And finally, students from middle school through graduate school intent on knowing their foundational history as Latinos and Latinas in the United States. We are also developing protocols. The protocols to develop post-custodial collections that address the receipt, ingestion, cataloging by Library of Congress subject, and the application of a Dublin Core Descriptive do remain at the foundation of our process, but the identification of and relationship to the materials does not end with this definition. The inclusion of the cultural markers of language, location, and object definition annotate the collection in robust and significant ways minimizing the occurrence of the, quote, object in a vacuum, end quote, material descriptions. This also includes accessibility. Building protocols means understanding the importance of an ongoing, often permanent relationship with a community to the archive. The most important element of this is access to the materials and their articulations, both public and private, of the work. This also includes an accountability. The protocol of accountability means that this network of communities understands their responsibility to the post-custodial archive. The collection is not just artifacts or data. It is the transformational moments of witness that each practitioner experiences within their own interactions with this artifact and data. For all participants, the collection becomes a group responsibility to produce. It creates in each person a sense of cultural obligation to record, document, curate, and ultimately give new and unique voice to material from moments that individually resonate. And finally, there is an understanding of the practice of labor. The protocol that defines a respect of the practice of labor means that we acknowledge that the practice of labor includes the ability to understand the types of labor we will encounter in this post-custodial process. Significantly, that labor is trauma, that labor is healing, and most important, that labor is acknowledged. So what does it mean as we interpret the archive as an active space of encuentro? Students work with material and subjects several generations removed in age and experience. 
The collaborative effort to document a collection allows the transgenerational exchange of knowledge for the subject to have witnessed to the story as experienced by students several generations removed, then for the students to articulate their witness of those stories through their own trans-historical and trans-cultural lens. And finally, it is about cultivating spaces of collegial knowledge production. In keeping with the goal of the archive as a space of encuentro, we acknowledge supporting the relationship of the subject and the practitioners to the collection as bi-directional, allowing the contributor to share the history and purpose of an object, the specifics of a life story, and the practitioner to articulate that knowledge. Together and within the community, these active elements combine to provide a comprehensive understanding and experience of the materials. The goal of community ethics centered in both a knowledge-based experience and giving back precludes that all knowledge is equal, all knowledge has value, and that all contributions are both sound and important to the collaborative production of a collection. Often our projects are led by scholars with an understanding that each practitioner and subject will have productive insights into the vision of a project. We are never allowed to forget that all voices matter, especially in projects that highlight contributions that have been historically neglected or silenced. And now my colleague, Dr. Baeza Ventura, will address many of the guiding principles in her example of using the collection application Omeka in the classroom. Omeka as pedagogy. Using Omeka in the undergraduate classroom in combination with underrepresented community archives allows students to interact with history in a more personalized way. Omeka provides a venue for sharing archival collections with a larger audience but can also function as a pedagogical tool for encouraging students to learn and contribute to knowledge production. As students work through the various tasks to complete the project, they critically engage with the archive, learn how to curate a collection, make decisions about metadata and language, especially when working with languages other than English, and become familiar with the history embedded in the archival collection itself. Such close interaction with the archive puts students in contact with untold stories contextualized by critical Latino and Latina theory. Moreover, this platform allows them to share content that is scholarly, creating opportunities to question where these stories lie and to ponder why they are not part of the historical and literary discourse of the United States. Through the use of recovery archives, students rehumanize the Latina and Latino community they bear witness to firsthand accounts that challenge the hegemonic narrative of national history. At USLDH, we understand rehumanizing the past as an action that amplifies voices in Latina and Latino collections, allowing them to take space and to speak for themselves by providing alternate historical accounts to those that depict them negatively. Through this process, students amplify the voices in the archive and enact what Emma Perez refers to as a decolonial imaginary. A decolonial imaginary as a rupturing space, the alternative to that which is written in history. I think that the decolonial imaginary is that time lag between the colonial and postcolonial, that interstitial space where differential politics and social dilemmas are negotiated. The historian's political project then is to write a history that decolonizes others. In the Omega exercise, students in a junior Spanish level class were given instructions to curate an exhibit that featured items from a recovery program at the University of Houston. Many, if not most of these students had never visited or worked with archives. The assignment was scaffolded into various activities. They were introduced to Omeka with training from a USLDH team member and digital humanities librarian, where students created logins for Omeka and learned how to use a platform. Students created journals in Google Drive that were shared with the instructor to log in all activities conducted toward the completion of the project. The class and instructor visited the archival collections online or in person. Each student identified two or three archives that they wanted to work with. 
each student scheduled an appointment with the archivist or archivists to discuss copyright and access to the collection of their interest. This meeting determined the availability of the collections for an online exhibit. Each student made a decision on which archive to use for their assignments. Then they scheduled a time or several times to review the collection to identify topics for the digital exhibit and to begin assessing which items to select. Students were to select 40 items for their Omega collection. Students communicated with archivists to digitize the selected items if they had, if they had not already been digitized and proceeded to scan if there was no digital surrogate. Students then drafted the organization of the 40 items in a thematic manner. They created Excel sheets with metadata for each item following Dublin core um, title, author, description, year, etc. Students created a collection on the Omeka site. Students uploaded digitized files to Omeka. Then students created Library of Congress subject headings for each item. For this class particularly, they created subject headings in English and in Spanish. Students selected 20 items for their exhibit. Uh, students conducted research on the archival materials selected in order to write an introduction of approximately 500 words to provide context for the exhibit. Using the journal that they kept, students drafted a document following Tomas Padillas' conventions established by Collections as Data to frame the protocols they followed to complete the project. The document was published under Criterio criteria in the exhibit and included the students' names, affiliation, course name, archives visited, any names of archivists who helped them in rationale in selecting images, as well as organization procedures. Students shared the introduction and protocols document with instructor to receive feedback before uploading those files to Omeka. Students prepared a bibliography. Uh, students organized exhibit on Omeka. Students presented the exhibit to instructor and classmates for feedback. Uh, students took the feedback and addressed uh, the items from the feedback and then published the exhibit. And finally, students wrote a short reflective essay on the exercise and turned in all materials for a grade. Throughout this extensive process, the instructors scheduled one-on-one -on -one appointments with students to discuss archive selection, thematic organization, metadata, and any other issues encountered. In these examples, students used Elena Arismendi's Feminismo Internacional, a magazine published in New York between 1922 and 1923. Arismendi sought to create a feminist network throughout the United States, Latin America, and Europe by compiling news about women's rights in the different countries and publishing Latina feminist thought that counter Anglo-feminism. Using the data collected from the archive, students showcased the variety of voices represented in this important publication. One, for example, decided to focus on the famous Latin American and Spanish people featured in the US newspaper. The student provided context for their inclusion in this publication and also drew conclusions about the significance of their presence alongside US and European celebrities, highlighting the fact that intellectual thought was happening at pretty much the same time and within the same spaces all over the world by both women and men alike. In the next example, a student chose to focus on the various women's roles represented in the newspaper. Woman as poet, woman as artist, woman as mother, woman as maid, etc. In the student's reflective essay, they indicated that it was important to, for her to demonstrate ways in which women used whatever resources were available to them to gain agency, to speak up, to advocate for other women. As you can see, each of these visualizations gave students access to primary source materials, promoting new knowledge production. Through this project-based learning, students use digital tools to engage and present the research. As you can see, each of these visualizations gave students access to primary source materials, promoting new knowledge production. Through this project-based learning, students use digital tools to engage and present the result of their research in innovative ways. This experience of working with Latina and Latino and underrepresented archives enhances the classroom dynamic to a collaborative environment, enacting Encuentro, Cotera's Chicana feminist praxis. This teaching and learning environment becomes a collaboration not only between professor and student researcher, but perhaps more importantly, between archival subject and researcher. 
Given this, that these archives would have remained hidden or lost, this engagement with technology allows contributors to bring the archival subjects to digital platforms in the 21st century to reclaim their humanity and space in the historical and literary record. In this assignment, we demonstrate that a digital archival platform such as Omeka can be a starting point through which the university organization can put into practice goals of social justice. When students, faculty, and archivists come together in a pedagogical activity such as this, all parties must reckon with the stakes and responsibilities attached to working with underrepresented archives. Furthermore, Omeka projects such as these are an interdisciplinary opportunity to learn firsthand from experts in the field of humanities, library studies, and technology. This pedagogical model enacts Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, as both students and educators coincide in their efforts to, quote, engage in critical thinking and the quest for mutual humanization. Not only in the humanization of the archival subject, but also for students as they gain the trust to become active producers and preservers of their community's histories, for in recovering their history, they can project into the future. And now my colleague, Dr. Lorena Gothero, will speak about community outreach to close our panel. At Recovery, we believe in not just working on archives and digital projects about the community, but more importantly, we believe in working for and with the community. Forming trusting relationships does not develop overnight. These are ties that we have formed and continue to nurture through decades of outreach and partnership. Community outreach should be based on an ethics of care, a process that recognizes archives and the communities they represent, not as mere objects of study that serve academic purposes. Instead, they represent people to whom we have a responsibility, whose emotions are acknowledged, valued, and appreciated. We understand recovering underrepresented community archives as an active validation of the community through language, preservation, collaboration, access, consent, and making visible the stories told therein. This includes what my colleagues have mentioned, post-custodial methods, citation, established protocols, creating decolonial spaces, and cultivating lasting relationships. An example of one of our community relationships is the collaboration between the civil rights organization LULAC and said Jobs for Progress that has resulted in a public event as well as subsequent summer high school internships and research scholarships for undergraduate students at recovery, as well as plans for future opportunities and events. LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens, is the oldest and largest Latino civil rights organization in the US. SED is a community organization that was created by LULAC in 1965 to provide employment recruitment resources. Since then, it has grown to provide training, education, scholarships, and job opportunities. Located in Houston's Latino East End, SED provided the space for a community reception where the USLDH program could launch digital projects about Alonso Esperales. Perales was one of the most prominent US civil rights leaders of the 20th century. He co-founded LULAC in 1929 and served as the second LULAC national president. He was also a lawyer, diplomat, consul general, and civil activist. His collection 40 linear feet of photographs, letters, official documents, affidavits, and more, was donated to recovery by his children, Marta Perales Carrizales and Raymond Perales in 2009. This community event allowed community members and current LULAC members to interact with their legacy of resistance, civil activism, knowledge production, and history making. The Perales collection is bilingual and represents the community through metadata in Spanish and English to increase searchability. In addition to the collection, we created various projects that allow people both inside and outside of academia to explore the history. One example is the Are We Good Neighbors project. 
While Perales corresponded regularly with U.S. political leaders, he also sought to empower his own community by encouraging people to publicly call out racist businesses by name. Hundreds of people of Mexican and Latino descent wrote letters to him and signed affidavits that described their lived experience of discrimination. Following Perales's call to action then, this project, like other USLDH projects, seeks to validate lived experiences, to bring them to light and call people to bear witness to them. Are We Good Neighbors reveals the personal history of racism, one that takes place in our neighborhoods to real people, rather than distance through abstract statistics. What becomes apparent when mapping these accounts is the personal and normalized embodiment of racism in the United States. One after another, these accounts tell stories of the quotidian, going out for dinner with family, spending time with friends, moving to a new house, riding the bus to school, or even going to the barber shop for a haircut. Yet for Mexican Americans in the 1940s, these quotidian activities are marked by disgust, hatred, shame, fear, and even violence. Mapping these instances gives a materiality to the offenses, geolocating them in neighborhoods and commercial centers still frequented today. Remembering injustices through this type of witnessing makes people of color visible and is, as Sarah Ahmed writes, quote, about claiming an injustice did happen. This claim is a radical one in the face of the forgetting of such injustices, end quote. Our goal in hosting community events and creating USLDH projects that are public facing then is an active resistance to canonical historical narratives that have erased our community's history. We insist on making visible these underrepresented narratives. Archives such as this are full of trauma, not just for the creators of the archives, but also for those represented in this history. As my colleague, Dr. Linda Garcia Merchant mentioned earlier, the labor of working with these archives is one of trauma. As women of color, the four of us can all testify to the heaviness of reading these hidden histories of discrimination and violence. The emotive weight transports you to a type of purgatory, an ephemeral space between the past and the present an in-between space, as graduate history student Disha Jani states, that for people of color is, quote, made more stark by the fact that they work within a system that often speaks about them, for them, but not with them, end quote. Recovery and USLDH seek to create spaces for healing, spaces that acknowledge the trauma of the archive with the capital A, both as a record and an institution of erasure. Virtual and physical spaces of healing include the acknowledgement of the trauma, mentorship opportunities that set people up for success, and contextualization that put Latina and Latino archival voices into conversation with each other. For example, supported by a LULAC Council 60 research scholarship, Catherine Zapata, an undergraduate student at the University of Houston, had the opportunity to learn about Latino civil rights activism and resistance, as well as gain training in digital tools. During her internship, she worked on an interactive timeline that highlights significant events in LULAC history. At Recovery, we are actively curating a decolonial space that ruptures colonial histories by reinserting our community history into the US narrative. Working with people in the community and with community archives is at its very essence about people. Because of our work with underrepresented archives, building community while apart takes special meaning. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we are physically separated, but continue to do the active work of recovering and sharing Latina and Latino historical legacies virtually. But it also reminds us how we have been physically distanced from our own history by colonial thinking that has continuously written us out of the archive. Anglo-centric worldviews that continue to other people of color use and have used fear tactics, legislation, and curriculum to distance our communities from our languages, 
national identities, cultures, and even our families. U.S. Latino Digital Humanities allows us to account for the ways that our history is transnational and does not fit into a neatly demarcated border of U.S. American National Studies. Recovering history and making it public facing in a variety of digital projects and events helps to create community, bridging the past with the present. By recovering the past, we can project toward our future. While working with recovered archives, we make space for healing by making visible not only painful histories, but also resistance, survival, and joy to acknowledge where we come from and where we are going. As Gloria Anzaldúa wrote in this bridge called My Back, quote, before turning our eyes forward, let's cast a look at the roads that led us here. The paths we have traveled on have been rocky and thorny, and no doubt they will continue to be so. But instead of the rocks and the thorns, we want to concentrate on the rain and the sunlight and the spider webs glistening on both." End quote. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Please visit artepublicopress.com for information on our Mellon funded grants and aid to support US Latino digital humanities projects. And follow us on social media. Please use the hashtag USLDH to tweet about US Latino digital humanities. Thank you. <laughs>